I thought I'd actually start by picking up on two comments that Anne Summers made when we had a conversation about my book uh, during Melbourne Writers' Festival. should actually also point out which Simon... Simon's voice didn't go up appropriately. It is the end of the homosexual with a question mark. I'm not seriously suggesting that as of the publication of this book, homosexuals vanished from the face of the earth. Um, in fact, I'm suggesting quite the opposite. But I wanted to pick up on two comments that Anne made and then say a little bit about them. Uh, one was she made the comment that she thought that of the social movements that had become important in the 60s and 70s in Western countries, the gay movement had possibly been the most successful. Um, and the other thing she said, which I found very interesting and somewhat flattering, was that there was no equivalent book written about the women's movement. Um, so I'm going to work backwards. I think what she meant by that is that what I've tried to do in writing this book is a sort of mix of personal and, and, and analytic, so that it's um, a book that clearly is framed by my own experiences to some extent, uh, and that's obvious if you've read the extract that's been put on the website, uh, but it's also a book that draws on a lot of other people's writing. Uh, I am, after all, an academic, so there are a lot of endnotes which you can ignore or you can use as references to further writings. And it was an attempt to actually situate what had changed in sexual politics in a much broader story of what's changed primarily in Australia but also globally. And I think in that sense, Anne was referring both to the fact that there is n nobody's actually tried to talk about what's changed for women in the same way in Australia, but secondly, that the gay movement um, and... In contemporary terms, we'd say the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer movement, um, a whole set of terms I have problems with, but you'll have to read chapter three to find out why. Um, the success has been quite extraordinary. And by success, I think one has to be able to cast one's mind back, which for some of you in the audience is literally impossible because you wouldn't have been alive 40 years ago. For others, it would be possible to recognise the extent to which there have been huge changes in the way in which people think about uh, sexuality, think about gender, and of course, think specifically about homosexuality, uh, which is what I had been primarily writing about. The other thing I'd say is that I was very struck. I was sitting on the train coming in to the city today and I was thinking, well, I really should talk about how this book came into being. Uh, Simon referred to my very first book, which I wrote, I stress, when I was very, very young. I like to say I wrote it when I was seven, but nobody believes me, um, Homosexual Oppression and Liberation, which I wrote in sort of that great flurry of countercultural excitement um, and social and cultural and political upheavals um, of the early 70s that we sort of associate in Australia with that wonderful phrase Donald Horne used, the time of hope, which is basically the few years leading up to the first Whitlam government. And when I wrote that first book, Homosexual Oppression and Liberation really grew out of the fact that by accident I'd fallen into the very early um, stages of the gay liberation movement in New York. It was a very American book. And over the last few years, I've been thinking, well, I wonder how I would go about some sort of, not a sequel, but some sort of re-evaluation of what had happened in the decades since that early book. And in fact, this book began as a project I was going to do with an American publisher, but it increasingly became clear to me that I couldn't really do that, um, partly because so much has been written in the US, but mainly because I no longer lived in the US and I didn't want to go back and spend the amount of time that I thought I would need to. And in fact, it took me a couple of years for the book to fall into shape. And what did it was a sudden recognition that 
the best way of telling the story was in terms of very specific changes that had occurred. And I want to mention two, one of which comes right on the first page and one of which comes much later in the book, that to me sum up the way in which attitudes, the general attitudes of Australian society towards homosexuality really have altered. And the first one is where I begin, actually, is... Two years ago, I was invited to Rockhampton by Central Queensland University to give a public lecture. And the reason I was invited is that research suggested that that part of Central Queensland uh, is the most homophobic part of Australia. And this worried the university sufficiently to bring me in as a guest of the Vice Chancellor to fly me up there, uh, Warren Inch, the Liberal Member of Parliament uh, from North Queensland flew down to Rockhampton to chair the event. Uh, I went on both local Rockhampton radio stations and the two announcers fell over themselves um, to be supportive and sympathetic and all the rest. And I compared that with my first trip to a Queensland Provincial University 30 years earlier when I was asked to go and speak by students, not by the Vice-Chancellor at James Cook University in Townsville, and to my great pride, one of the things I'm proudest of in my life, I not only got savaged by the Townsville Daily Bulletin, I actually got attacked in the Queensland State Parliament by then Premier Joe Bielke peterson which, you know, I wear as a badge of honour. It's as good as having been called a few weeks ago by Greg Sheridan in The Australian, a bleeding heart, in a list that included Malcolm Fraser and John Hewson. Again, I'm very proud of that. Um, the other story is I talk much later in the book, I sort of talk about being at the Pride Party that traditionally ends the Midsummer Festival in Melbourne, uh, which is a big queer event um, in the summer, and there's a march down Fitzroy Street, St Kilda. OK, I could be very cynical, as I usually am, and say it does not take a great deal of bravery for a whole lot of queers to march down Fitzroy Street, St Kilda. Um, if, they really want, if we wanted to be brave, we would actually go to Broad Meadows or Dandenong or somewhere. But let's face it, Fitzroy Street's nicer and there's a park at the end. And what I was struck by was at the party at the end, there were a number of cops wandering around. But the cops were there because they enjoyed being there and they were protecting the people at the festival. And I'm old enough, and some of you in this room will be old enough to, of course, associate the police with quite vicious attacks on homosexuals. And indeed, in some ways, the founding moment of um, the modern gay movement in Australia, which is largely forgotten, was the drowning of uh, George Duncan, a law lecturer in Adelaide, almost certainly by a group of Adelaide cops, um, although it's never been uh, totally established. And those two stories, it seems to me, really bring together some of the major changes. And I guess what I'm fascinated by at the moment is the extent to which we've seen these sorts of changes in Australia they go hand in hand, of course, with a whole lot of other changes. And I was very conscious that I wanted to write a book that was not an in-book. It's not only for the queer community, because I wanted to link this to the other sorts of developments in Australia, the emergence of multiculturalism, the huge shifts in the way in which women are perceived, um, which is, of course, at the moment a matter of very considerable controversy given the amount of misogyny that we've experienced over the last year politically. But I also wanted to link it to the great global debate that is currently going on around sexuality. And while in countries like ours, one could use Anne's term and talk about success, this is clearly not the case in many parts of the world. And there is, in fact, a growing international polarisation with a number of countries, at the moment led by Russia, where Putin is embarked on a quite vicious anti-homosexual campaign, um, but with very strong support in most of the Islamic and African world. Um, and this is increasingly becoming a matter of international debate. Uh, to the extent that the Secretary General of the UN has several times called for uh, universal decriminalisation of homosexuality, which remains an actual crime in something like 70 countries. 
where there was a very bitter debate in the UN, even over accepting that one should oppose killing people on the basis of their sexuality. I mean, odd as it would seem to us in Australia, many, many countries refuse to even vote for that resolution. And that international polarisation raises really interesting questions about how do we, sitting in a rich liberal society, effectively have an impact where people are being persecuted because of their sexuality or their gender. And it becomes very easy to make grand gestures. And I might end actually by a realization I had a few months ago when I was at a conference in Paris um, and somebody was talking about President Obama's visit to Senegal. And President Obama, and, and he did this with a lot of slides and visuals, so you could actually see President, you know, you could see Air Force One touching down at Dakar Airport, and President Obama coming down, you know, that wonderful way he has of coming down the runway, uh, sorry, the gangway, and almost his first statement in Senegal was to say, Senegal needs to repeal its anti-homosexual laws. Now, of course, I agree with President Obama, but it suddenly struck me, you know, these, these moments when you suddenly think, well, if a US president landed in Canberra, got off the plane and said, Australia should reintroduce capital punishment and scrap your gun laws, I'd be pretty pissed off. I would actually have a strong nationalist reaction, which is, of course, exactly what happened in Senegal. And I tell that story because I think it points to the huge difficulty of trying to defend universal human rights without, in fact, hardening the opposition when the opposition can draw on nationalist and often um, religious uh, sanctification for what they do. Well, that probably makes the book sound somewhat heavier and more theoretical than it is. Um, I should point out that, that it was a book that I deliberately wrote, not as an academic, but to be read more generally. Um, and in the end, it's a book that was only possible for me to write because essentially I'd either experienced a great deal of what I'm writing about, or in many cases was able to sit down, had a lot of cups of coffee. This is one of the nice things about writing non-fiction, because when you write fiction, um, your characters on the whole are not willing to meet you at Mario's. Uh, when you write non-fiction, you can do that. And a lot of people who will be familiar to you um, as figures in Australian cultural life over the last uh, four decades show up in this book in different ways, and I'm deeply indebted to them um, in all sorts of ways, both acknowledged and unacknowledged. <laughs>